Hello, uh, I think uh, we're just going to get uh, go ahead started uh, before the, maybe other people will walk in. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Mark Barto. Um, I could spend the next half an hour describing his accomplishment, but I want to make it very short. Uh, so now he's the director at the Energy Institute in, at the uh, University of Michigan, and before that he was the senior vice senior vice Pre provost for research at the University of Delaware. Uh, he has won many, many awards. Uh, for example, he's um, National Academy of Engineering. And he was also the top 100 engineers, not just chemical engineers, top 100 engineers in the century. So um, uh, personally, I, I, I knew Mark. Uh, he's been my mentor and uh, inspiration for many years. He was the reason I went to the University of Delaware. And also, by coincidence, we left on the same day uh, from the University of Delaware. So Mark, it's all yours. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, thank Professor Barto for his talk. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jing Wang, when you announced your departure from Delaware, it just wasn't worth sticking around anymore. So. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so it was suggested that perhaps uh, I should should wear a couple of hats today. Uh, one, my Energy Institute director hat, and talk about some of the activities that we have going on, especially. Uh, in the domain uh, more of, of policy. And then, uh, so that'll be about the first third of the talk, uh, at least it's the first third of the slides. Uh, and uh, then uh, to, to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing in, in catalysis. And like many others in the field, uh, our objective there is to reduce the carbon footprint of chemical processes. <clears throat> so, uh, I think this slide, which I've taken from the Global Carbon Project, tells you almost everything you need to know about the, the carbon challenge. 91% uh, of the uh, CO2 that we're emitting into the, or into the environment uh, comes from fossil fuel combustion, and 44% of that is going into the atmosphere. So one of the ways I think about it is that the the 400 plus ppm that we have up there already is in effect our debt to the planet and the 44 percent that that uh, of emissions that we're adding to that every year represents the deficit so one of the challenges is to sort of stop our deficit spending right uh, zero emissions and in fact to begin to to pay down the debt so uh, at the University of Michigan, our Energy Institute involves about 150 uh, affiliated faculty, some more affiliated than others. Uh, our aim is to tackle the world's uh, pressing energy challenges. That almost sounds like an ExxonMobil commercial, but there are only so many ways you can say it. Uh, and the fun part is, like Columbia, the, the university has a lot of strength in both the sciences and in uh, social science and, and policy and trying to bring those together. So we're working on things like carbon free energy sources and CO2 reduction, energy storage. We have a, a large battery user facility that's open to, to anyone. So if you're interested in doing battery work, you can, can come use that either to make batteries or to characterize them. Uh, transportation systems and obviously in Michigan there's a lot going on in connected and automated vehicles. The, the, the car manufacturers are very interested in how this is going to, to play out and what their business is going to look like in the future. Uh, and then policy, economics, and, and societal impact. And, and uh, even though I'm a chemical engineer by training, I have really been emphasizing this to my science and engineering colleagues. Uh, and, and uh, you know, an incredibly important part of, of what we do to address uh, energy and environmental challenges. So I just wanted to, to, to give you some examples of the kinds of things that we're trying to do uh, on the side of policy, public engagement, and social sciences. Uh, one of them that we completed uh, a few years ago was a study of uh, Michigan's uh, ability to increase its renewable portfolio standard. So our standard was 10% renewables by 2015, uh, and we're obviously past that now. Uh, the uh, legislature ultimately, uh, with uh, an interesting coalition that crossed uh, party lines and left off the fringes of both parties, uh, did manage to increase that to 15% uh, by, I think, 2021. 
two or something like that. It's certainly well behind New York standards and well behind most progressive states. Um, but, but we did an analysis uh, basically uh, modeling the, the cheapest way, uh, literally hour by hour, that that could be met into the future, uh, looking at, at wind and solar, uh, and basically concluded that to get to, for example, 25% by 2025 uh, would cost the average consumer here uh, about the price of a cup of Starbucks a month. Probably not the price of a cup of Starbucks in New York City. Uh, there, there, there are parts of our legislature that, that find that intolerable, but, but uh, th this uh, we put out there knowing that the issue was going to come back up before the legislature, and uh, certainly I think it was, uh, while we didn't lobby, we certainly uh, had information uh, sessions with different legislators, and uh, I think was helpful in reassuring them that this was not going to cost the average consumer an arm and a leg. Uh, if they did raise the, the state's renewable portfolio standard. Uh, one of the other things we've done is to conduct a national survey of consumers uh, uh, related to energy. This hitchhikes off uh, the uh, survey of consumers done by the Institute for Social Research at Michigan. It's done monthly, and when you hear the consumer sentiment index on the radio every month, that's where it comes from. We do a quarterly rider on that asking 17 energy questions. Uh, and it's been going on for about four years and I think produced some, some fairly interesting results. Um, one of the things that we ask about is the relative degree of concern that people have about uh, environment affordability and reliability. Uh, and what you see there is reliability comes in a distant third. Uh, the lights stay on most of the time. We haven't had gas lines in this country in, you know, 30 plus years. And so the average consumer takes that for, for granted. If you ask this of utility company engineers, I assure you, you get a very different response. Um, you see over the last four years, concerns about affordability have been tracking downward. We've been in a, an era for the last three years plus of relatively cheap energy prices. Uh, and concern about the environment uh, is actually tracking up. Uh, and we, we don't ask these questions in a way that says, how much would you be willing to pay for? Uh, so, uh, and, and this also gets uh, broken down into to different uh, income levels and a variety of other demographics. So uh, this shows you the, uh, the breakdown by income tercile of concerns about affordability, reliability, and the environment. And obviously the, the uh, bottom third of the income levels are, tend to be more concerned about affordability and reliability, but the concern about the environment is pretty much across the, the board, across the economic spectrum. We also ask at what price energy would become unaffordable. And so when we ask that about the price of gasoline, the average is about $5 a gallon, which may seem pretty high. Uh, but again, this is the price not at which people will scream or will throw the bums out of office, but at which they say, you know, I'd really have to change my lifestyle and the way I get around. Um, and what you notice is it more or less parallels the, the actual price of gas, which is shown on the bottom here. So, you know, people by the seat of their pants either say, you know, a couple dollars a gallon more or about twice what I'm paying now. Uh, and so actually the cheaper gas gets uh, the cheaper their perception of what they, the lower their perception of what they could afford gets, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but we can also turn this around when we dissect that by, by income levels. And one of the questions is, if we were to implement a carbon tax, how would this fall on different parts of the population? So uh, right now, if we ask about uh, the unaffordability of gasoline, about 4% of the lowest uh, third of the economy uh, consumers say it's unaffordable now. And if we look at what people say is their unaffordable threshold and look at the intersection of what a carbon price would do to the cost of, of gasoline, and you see $10 a ton equates to about nine cents a gallon, so $100 a ton, uh, about 90 cents a gallon. And so you see here progressively the, the, the um, significant increase 
in uh, the, the lowest uh, third of, of incomes uh, that would find that level of a, a carbon tax or, or, or gas tax uh, to, to create uh, unaffordable gasoline. So, you know, I think it's important not just to look at uh, the averages, but to recognize that uh, the burdens of different policies will fall differently on different parts of society and to take that into account when, when crafting policy. So hopefully this is the kind of information that policymakers might find useful. Uh, I wanted to mention one other large initiative that we've launched called Beyond Carbon Neutral that involves uh, about 50 faculty around the campus the idea is to look at uh, carbon negative processes that the world will need those in addition to reduction of emissions uh, within the next couple of decades under virtually all the IPCC scenarios. And uh, our activities really fall into to three categories. Uh, one is looking at what the biosphere can do, so looking at uh, afforestation and reforestation, forest management, uh, soil carbon and agriculture, uh, land use and so forth. Uh, another uh, portion looking at, at technology for carbon capture and uh, utilization uh, and storage. And then the, the third leg of the stool is looking at human systems and public awareness, public opinion, uh, ma markets, policy, and the kinds of policy and market signals that are, will be required to, to make some of these solutions feasible. So if you're interested, I've listed the, the website there, beyondcarbonneutral.org. We find it faster to put up websites if we don't go through the official university system. I should have told you to stop recording, but hopefully nobody in Michigan is watching that. I'm sure the same thing doesn't happen here. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight it. So we've been funding seed grants for a couple of years and highlight a couple of the interesting results that have come out of those. And there's really much more beginning to appear, including uh, federal funding that's beginning to follow some of our seed grants. Yes, even under this administration. Um, <clears throat> so we have a group in our uh, Institute for Social Research that's asked about the influence of learning about carbon dioxide removal on support for mitigation policies. And so, uh, you know, most people don't know much about carbon dioxide removal, so the way this works is they're, they're given uh, information about some carbon dioxide removal technique and then, you know, asked about their opinion of, of that and mitigation. And, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, learning about carbon dioxide removal strategies does reduce support for mitigation policies, so if people think that we're going to turn on a giant hoover in 2050 and suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere, then we might as well party like it's 1999 uh, today. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, there was a, a, a political uh, division here. This risk compensation pattern was more pronounced among political conservatives than liberals. So if you think there's a, a, a solution down the line, then the, the conservative approach is do, do less now. Um, but it, you know, it does say as we think about ways to, to uh, implement policies, gain public awareness and support for uh, carbon dioxide removal, that there are also some, some uh, downside consequences of, of human behavior, as in if we think we can you know, postpone the problem, we, we will. It's sort of, you know, this is very much analogous to uh, uh, the approach many of us take to our diets, right? We'd all like to lose weight. But, you know, some of us are not very good at actually following through on, on what it takes. And we're all looking for the magic pill that will do it for us. No. Um, other work in techno-economics and basically uh, trying to look at the uh, horizon for emissions reductions and pointing out that we need to get going uh, pretty darn quickly. This is looking at the U.S. automotive sector. Uh, or we're going to reach a point where we can't really achieve the 80% by 2050 uh, target reductions. And, and again, if you look at, at alternative strategies, uh, putting off the, the problem uh, is economically justifiable under basically uh, no scenario. Uh, one of the other things that we've been trying to do is to get more faculty and more students to engage in the sort of public-facing part of our activity. So a few years ago, 
several of the other university-wide institute directors and I got together and put together a project on academic engagement in public and political discourse. And this culminated in a, about a three-day meeting a couple of years ago. And I show this for a couple of reasons. One, you can actually buy the report on Amazon, uh, I think for about 10 bucks. The other is I just love this graphic, right? The view from the, the, uh, the, the podium of, of what's out there in the audience and you know the monsters, some favorable, some unfavorable. Uh, and uh, for any assistant professors in the audience, this probably was what the first day of classes looked like for you when you were up there. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that came out of this uh, was, uh, 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 and, and through a lot of our outreach activities, is, is realization that this is a two-way street. It doesn't do any good to sort of parachute in as the expert and say, I've got the solution to your problem. You know, public engagement is really that, right? Working with people where they live and with their concerns to try to come to, to, to viable solutions. Um, and that's also another part of, of what makes this side of actually affecting uh, societal change uh, a challenge. Uh, finally, we're doing some subversive things around the university. We have created a, a, a contest in collaboration with our media center uh, for student teams to visualize the university's carbon footprint. So we put up $15,000 worth of prize money. I think we've got close to 20 teams. Some of them are doing virtual reality stuff. I just got a request uh, uh, for a 3D model of the football stadium. So my guess is somebody's going to you know, uh, do a project showing how many football stadiums full of CO2 represent the university's carbon footprint. Uh, the reaction to this was, was very interesting from the School of Sustainability and Environment, the art and design, architecture, yada yada around the university. It was all, that's great, how do we get in? And from engineering it was, do you really want to do that? So yes, we really want to do it. So uh, we're, we're, we're going to unveil uh, the, the results the first week in December and, and we'll be publicizing those. So check out our website uh, then. Uh, and the other thing that, that we try to do is, is uh, walk the talk or talk the walk and actually try to get information and uh, perspective pieces out there in the public. Uh, these are some of the ones that I've authored uh, over about the past year and a half uh, looking at, uh, you know, the, what the, the regime in Washington is, is what effect uh, they may have on uh, energy and climate, but also looking at electric vehicles and how they can transform the utility market. Uh, and also about uh, uh, the oil collapse there. Uh, and then frequent media appearances. Um, so I was quoted in Time last spring basically saying about Trump's coal policy, it's nonsense. Um, and uh, I was actually quoted in, in the New York Times on, on Friday about the Chinese investment in, in the uh, natural gas pipeline and liquef uh, liquefaction. Uh, plans for uh, for Alaska. So, um, you know, in all of these, we're trying to offer perspectives and, and not lobby or advocacy, but but certainly not pulling punches about uh, the consequences of of, uh, of different different uh, policies at the state and national level. So, that that's part of the fun of my job. Uh, you know, dealing with reporters takes some practice. Those of you who've done it, like I, probably have a few scars to show for it and things that made it into print or in the media that you wish hadn't been said quite that way. But at the end of the day, I think it's, it's, it's really important that uh, those with strong technical backgrounds that have got the ability to put uh, these things in perspective for society step up and do that. And so for the students in the audience, as those opportunities arise in your career, uh, or as you consider future career paths, I hope you'll, you'll, you'll think about those, those opportunities. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears here and talk about uh, catalysis. Uh, and I'd like to start with, with this report that came out of, of Europe, uh, it's getting a bit, bit old now, in 2013, looking at uh, the opportunities for improvements in catalysis to reduce energy and greenhouse gases uh, in the chemical industry. And 
I'll just show you a few slides from this report, but the conclusion was that, that you know, there was a reasonable amount of headroom, right, to reduce energy intensity and save up to a gigaton of, of CO2 per year. Uh, requires incremental improvements, best practice technologies, and then uh, emerging technologies, especially in uh, carbon-free hydrogen, uh, well, I guess those are the game changers, and, and biomass feedstocks to, to continue to, uh, to cut CO2 from the chemical industry beyond that. And they have a number of plots looking at the carbon footprint of, of different chemicals. The, the, one of, uh, the, the figures in this report that I'm the fondest of is this one. And this shows you the energy loss, and one could turn that into an equivalent CO2 footprint resulting from catalytic processes that aren't completely selective to the desired products. So this essentially shows you the, the uh, inefficiency of these processes coming from lack of selectivity. And if you look at them, uh, so this is terephthalic acid, uh, here is ethylene oxide, which is one of my favorites. They're, they're almost all selective oxidation processes. And the challenge with selective oxidation is that the, the thermodynamically preferred product is always CO2. And so the challenge is to, to do just the oxidation that you want uh, and, and no more. And this is actually where I've spent a considerable fraction of my research career. So I wanted to, to talk to you about sort of molecular level understanding of a couple of different selective oxidation processes that we've looked at. And, and some of this is published and is easy to find in the literature, and some of it uh, is, is a lot newer. So let me start with the old story. Um, this is epoxidation of ethylene to ethylene oxide, this molecule on the right. Commercial processes for this typically today have selectivities over 90% when the catalyst is new, but, but declining over time. Uh, this, if you know, the, the bars on the previous slide were ranked in order of uh, more or less in terms of, of, uh, of volume. Um, and so this is a pretty important uh, industrial chemical that gets used both for uh, polyethylene oxide, which the bio folks in here may use, and for you know, things as, as mundane as, as ethylene glycol for the antifreeze in your car. Actually, you were talking about awards, and I was talking about the press. A few years ago when I was at Delaware, I, I, I received an award and talked to a local reporter about it, and, and the, the story that ran in the paper was headlined, Antifreeze Expert Wins Award, because I tried to explain to him what this chemistry was good for. Uh, needless to say, I took a lot of ribbing. How about that? <clears throat> so this is a, a fascinating reaction. I've described it as kind of like a virus. Once you get it in your blood, you never get rid of it. Um, Silver is the only catalyst for doing it, and ethylene is really the only thing that can be done commercially. And the, the reactor is basically a gigantic heat exchanger because the, uh, the, reaction, the desired reaction is exothermic, and the undesired reaction is, is even more exothermic. So you've got a lot of heat to shed. And if you go to virtually any reaction engineering book, they're going to show you this famous series parallel or triangular reaction network. So this is the desired reaction, ethylene to ethylene oxide, and there are two roads to ruin, either by combusting the reactant or by over-oxidizing the product, right? This is just, th this is textbook. Turns out the textbook's not quite right. So one of the things that we were able to, to show by a combination of single crystal surface science and density functional theory and microkinetic modeling was that there was a key intermediate in this process that had never been seen before. We actually did isolate it in surface science experiments, called an oxymetallocycle. So it's oxa and then the metals here, and it's cyclic, so that's the reason uh, for the, the name. Um, and the, the actual reaction network looks like this, that you form that on the surface, and it has uh, two possible reaction channels. One is to close the, the ring, the other is to isomerize, if you move one hydrogen over from one carbon to the next to make acetaldehyde, which silver burns pretty readily. And we were able to show that, that the rate is actually controlled by the steps leading up to this point, 
and the selectivity is controlled by the branching ratio uh, between those two reactions. So it's an interesting example. Often in catalysis, uh, selectivity, or selectivity comes at the, the uh, price of activity. Uh, they're, they're sort of competitive, and in a purely sequential reaction, that would be the case. In this case, they're uncoupled. The other important point is that mathematically, this network is, is uh, indistinguishable from that triangular reaction network that, that's in all the textbooks. So basically, once you start doing chemistry on the surface, once you've started down this pathway, if you fall off of that pathway at any point before you get to the final gas phase product, th th this network is mathematically identical to the, to the series parallel network. Um, and so given this level of understanding, we could then do, for example, density functional theory to ask about what can we do to tweak the relative rates of these two reactions and improve the selectivity. And, and predicted and actually showed that addition of small amounts of copper to the catalyst, actually this is selectivity plotted here as a function of, of oxygen and, and ethylene partial pressure. This is compared to uh, a pure silver catalyst and then adding progressive amounts of copper that we could raise the selectivity by uh, about 15 points and we could uh, go even higher with, with other promoters. So this is a very nice example of, of things actually predicted on the computer and then realized in the laboratory. But at the end of the day, while, while this is satisfying, it's still a little bit unsatisfying. Uh, if you look at, our, at the catalyst, right, this is, a, this is actually a bad catalyst. This is silver and gold rather than silver and copper. But, you know, you see these fuzzy catalyst particles, right, and, and so these, these are the metal particles. And, you know, this is kind of a long way from the single crystal model systems that we were, were working with before. You know, it would be nice, I mean, we can sort of do it qualitatively or perhaps even semi-quantitatively to translate the, the fundamental work to the operating catalyst, but there are limits to that because ultimately the, the, the active metal surface of the catalyst uh, looks different. There are different strategies for, for doing this. Jing Wang has done a lot of work with polycrystalline systems. So again, trying to figure out how to span this gap between a highly ordered model system and, a, a, uh, and the real world catalyst that doesn't necessarily uh, have quite as obvious a structural connection as one might wish. So that's the, the other story I want to tell you in the time remaining. Um, one of our ideas was to try to use, and, and some of this is not terribly novel, but to try to use molecular catalysts on surfaces so that we would have the same discrete sites on actual catalysts that we have on model materials. So, you know, what if our, we could create a surface lattice on the, the, the material of our choice that consisted of species that had catalytic properties that weren't just individual atoms? And so a number of years ago, we began to work on self-assembled inorganic monolayers. And our favorite materials are polyoxometallates. So these are uh, typically anions when can form cationic structures. This is uh, the Kegan structure. So it involves a heteroatom like phosphorus in the middle. You can substitute other heteroatoms. 12 metal oxygen octahedra around the perimeter. So there's a metal atom at the base of each of these and the yellows are, are the oxygens. So you can think of it like a metal oxide soccer ball and you can make a number of other structures, metal oxide footballs, peanuts, donuts, you know, take your pick. These are the easiest to make and probably the most commonly studied. These are known catalysts, uh, and they've been used commercially for uh, a number of, of catalytic processes that I've listed on the left. The ones in blue involve acid catalysis, and the ones in red involve oxidation catalysis. As I said, these things are negatively charged, and so you need counter ions. And so if the counter ions are protons, you have acid sites there, and they can catalyze uh, reactions like hydrations and, and dehydrations. So our initial work was looking at self-assembled polyoxometallate monolayers. And I'll show you some STM images that 
really do look like they're single crystal. So the idea was that we could incorporate uh, more complicated catalytic functions uh, into these highly ordered arrays and sort of use these as you know, molecular Legos to, to, to build catalysts. So this is the STM image I promised. So this is uh, a monolayer, and we know it's a monolayer because if it gets thicker, we can't tunnel through it in, in scanning tunneling microscopy, um, of phosphomolybdic acid self-assembled basically by drying a droplet of aqueous solution on graphite. And what you're seeing here are the individual one nanometer metal oxide soccer balls arranged in, arranged in a near square lattice on the surface. That's nice, but we can actually go in and do spectroscopy molecule by molecule. So if we park the tip of the scanning tunneling microscope over one of these and ramp the voltage, we'll see a current pass, or we can do that over the interstitial position. And we get two different results. If we do it over one of these molecules, this is the tunneling spectrum, so this is current versus voltage, and we see essentially a band gap here where we have very little current, and then we see the current spike. And this is referred to as negative differential resistance. And if we tunnel uh, through the interstitial position, we essentially see the fingerprint of graphite. And what's interesting about this is that there is a characteristic voltage at which this negative differential resistance occurs. Here for the phosphomolybdic acid, it's about minus 0.95 volts. And it turns out that there's chemical information there. So just to show you that, um, oh, I, I, sorry, I guess I threw out a few slides. Um, what, one of the things that, that we have found is that basically the voltage at which uh, that um, occurs is dependent on the redox properties of the, the, uh, the material. So uh, this is an example. So one of the things we did was, was to make mixed arrays of the uh, molybdenum and tungsten compounds and show that we could distinguish them uh, on the basis of their tunneling spectrum, literally molecule by molecule across the surface. Uh, one can, can, again, get the sense that this is coupled to chemical properties. Here's an example uh, looking at uh, this is the, the phosphomolybdic acid and exchanging it either cesium for protons or copper for the protons. And in the case of copper, uh, as we exchange it in, uh, basically the materials become easier to reduce and the negative differential resistance peaks shift to less negative voltage. As we exchange in cesium, they become harder to reduce uh, over here and the NDR voltage goes in the opposite direction. One can make similar comparisons to electrochemical data. Uh, the problem is that's usually an aqueous solution and everybody does their electrochemistry differently. So it's, it's a little hard to come up with a comprehensive uh, scale of redox properties from the literature. Uh, but we can do that with this tunneling spectroscopy uh, technique. So this is showing you about three dozen different compounds that we've looked at over the years. And so here is their, our phosphomolybdic acid here at about minus 0.95 volts. And again, we can manipulate different parts of this structure. So this is showing you what happens as you change the counter ion in the middle, substitute, for example, silicon uh, and, and arsenic for the phosphorus in the middle, or substitute uh, tungsten uh, for the molybdenum. On the right is what happens as you substitute different framework metal atoms, uh, different combinations of molybdenum and tungsten, substituting vanadium in. And then on the, the left here is what happens as you exchange different cations in. Here was cesium, here was copper, and so forth. And so we see a, a fairly wide range of uh, characteristic uh, voltages at which this NDR behavior occurs. And if you look at the catalysis literature, you begin to realize that this is actually giving you a, a, a road map for catalyst design. So the, the materials here with the most negative NDR voltages are the ones uh, um, that basically uh, are the least active oxidation catalysts, and so they will oxidize molecules that are pretty easy to oxidize, like aldehydes. As we go further up the scale, the, the ones in the middle tend to do be effective for things like oxidative dehydrogenations. And if you want to do a tougher reaction like alkane oxidation, you need the, the ones up here. 
um, that really have sort of the most oxidizing power. <clears throat> So this has lain dormant in the literature for about 15 years. And so in the last few years, we've been interested in actually trying to, to pursue some of these ideas. And that's the story I want to tell you in, in the, the time remaining. Uh, the idea is, you know, if, if you look at these things at the top of the scale, uh, they frequently have uh, transition metals in the counter ion positions. <clears throat> and so can we think about these as catalysts that combine sort of um, metal and uh, metal oxide oxidation functions? <clears throat> to be honest, we haven't gotten quite that far yet. And the reason is, the first thing we decided to do was to try to understand, <coughs> excuse me, understand what happens when you remove the protons from these systems and substitute just nominally inert conorides. So our preferred test reaction here is um, methanol oxidation. <clears throat> and methanol is interesting in that it can follow two pathways. One is the acid catalyzed dehydration to dimethyl ether. The other is the oxidation of formaldehyde and subsequent coupling products of formaldehyde. So we've got a chemical probe of oxidation selectivity here, and our interest is in looking at what happens as we remove protons from the system. One might expect that to promote uh, the oxidation behavior. Um, and then we've also been looking at use of, of basic supports, nitrogen containing carbons, to neutralize the protons. And I'll show you one slide on that at the end. <clears throat> so, if you're going to use different model systems, it's important that they be stable. So, this is a, a good object lesson here. This is performing the methanol oxidation reaction uh, on these catalysts. This is the, the phosphomolybdic acid on silica at not terribly high temperatures. And what we observe at the end of our quartz tube, where we have a cold spot at the end of the furnace, is a nice blue film of molybdenum oxides. So basically, we're decomposing the catalyst that was originally had a nice color to it. It's now looking fried, and we've got molybdenum downstream. And one of the important lessons here is if we'd done this in a stainless steel tube, we'd have never known this happened. Right? By doing it in quartz, we can actually see the transport of, of the metal. So, and it's kind of a reminder that you know, the human eye is a pretty good spectrometer. So here's what happens if, if we run it under somewhat milder conditions. The catalyst stays a nice green color, and we don't get any molybdenum oxide down the tube. So one of the, the challenges in taking some of the literature data is it's not always clear that people uh, had stable catalysts or realized when they didn't in the literature, again, if they weren't uh, actually, didn't have the capability of looking. Um, this is details of the preparation. I won't go into it, except we typically operate at a, close to a quarter of a monolayer uh, loading of these things. Um, we're trying to keep conversions below 10% so we can be differential and uh, a few other details there. So, you know, one of the things that, that we want to do is to have these molecularly dispersed. Um, and so we, what we don't want to see are the characteristic diffraction lines of the clusters of these polyoxymetallate compounds. And we have gone through different loadings and different levels of cation exchange and convinced ourselves that we can prepare well-dispersed systems. Uh, we do see evidence uh, at low angles for small uh, two-dimensional arrays. Um, we can see that they're intact in the infrared, and basically we can do this before and after reaction and convince ourselves that, that uh, the catalyst didn't change noticeably during that time. So that's important. Now, Enrique Iglesi at Berkeley has done some, some beautiful work on these uh, catalysts uh, with the same reaction. And he has, he's done two things. One is to look at the um, 
rates of the, uh, this is the oxidation reaction, this is the, the dehydration to dimethyl ether, this is the turnover rate per polyoxymetalate on the surface as a function of polyoxymetalate loading. And it looks like the textbook tells you it ought to look, right? You vary the number of catalyst sites and the, the rate per site is essentially dead constant. Right? That's great. That's the world we all would like to live in. That's why these are such an appealing model system. The other clever experiment he's done is to co-feed <coughs> dye tertiary uh, uh, butylpyridine to poison the acid sites. And as he does that, what you see is this progressive decay of both the acid activity and the oxidation activity. And so his conclusion was that oxidation actually requires acid sites, and, and we concur with that. But the, the problem with this experiment is um, he's always got a fixed number of protons per polyoxymetalate. Because when you do this titration, essentially the, the pyridine moves down the bed in plug flow, and you get a breakthrough at the end. So you either have essentially completely poisoned sites or completely unpoisoned sites at the, <coughs> the front of the wave. So our interest was actually in varying the local proton concentration in a way that was independent of the polyoxymetalate concentration because we thought that was important in then trying to add a second catalytic function. This turns out to be a lot more complicated than one might expect. So um, one of the challenges here is figuring out how to normalize your turnover frequencies. Right? So one can count the number of polyoxymetalates, but if you're varying the number of protons per polyoxymetalate, you know, that, then you would expect the rate to decline. So this is the rate of the acid-catalyzed reaction per polyoxymetalate as a function of sodium exchange. And what one would expect, right, if we had one-for-one one exchange of sodiums with protons, that this ought to decline in this fashion, that if we replace a third of the protons, the rate would fall by a third and so forth. It's clearly falling faster than that. So this tells us we need ways to count the protons. Uh, we've done that uh, a couple of different ways. Um, one is by butene chemisorption. And so what you see is we start not quite with three protons per polyoxymetalate, but closer to two, and we do see <coughs> more or less a linear decrease with the exchange up to the nominal stoichiometric level. So it's not the perfect line that we might expect, but it's basically the trend is the same, and, and so, you know, its effect on the denominator of our turnover frequency should be pretty similar. If we do the Iglesi experiment and uh, use the, the, the uh, dye uh, tert-butyl pyridine, right, we see uh, what looks even better, again, from two down to, to much closer to zero when we've done the stoichiometric exchange. We've <coughs> also done this with magnesium and aluminum, and I'm not going to talk about those. They're <coughs> qualitatively similar, but the, the multivalent cations are more complicated. So we've got ways to count the protons. So obviously we can normalize the rate per proton now and calculate a turnover frequency. And in the ideal world, this ought to be dead flat as we exchange sodiums in because all that matters are the protons. And you see it's not. But even normalizing for proton concentration, the rate still continues to fall. Uh, the turnover rate as we replace uh, <coughs> protons with sodiums. And in fact, we see the oxidation <coughs> turnover frequency per palm fall more or less in parallel. Um, we can plot those against each other. So here's the oxidation turnover frequency per palm against the dehydration turnover frequency per proton. Uh, and what you see, this is now for the uh, uh, H3 PMO 40 exchanging, I think this is half a sodium, one sodium, two sodiums, and three into that, and more or less a, a linear decrease. Um, <clears throat> so 
One of the, the things we did was, you may wonder why if we've got acid sites we're not using ammonia adsorption to titrate those, and the answer is ammonia sticks to everything and the ammonia TPD is not very helpful, except that uh, what we find is <coughs> that um, we actually oxidize ammonia to, to N2 at high temperatures, and two things, one, the amount of nitrogen that we make correlates extremely well with the uh, acid site count that we get from the in, uh, in situ titration experiment. So this is actually another way to count acid sites, not from the ammonia that desorbs, because there's ammonia stuck on everything, but from the ammonia oxidation. Uh, but we also see as we exchange the cations that the, the uh, nitrogen peak shifts, in fact, to, to lower temperatures. So one of the things we did was to, to go back and um, so here's our, our, our dehydration turnover frequency. And uh, so we could ask, okay, let's assume that <clears throat> the, the pre-exponential factor is the same in all of these. How much of a difference in activation energy would it take to produce that change in rate? <clears throat> Now, we had separately measured the activation energies in all of these by varying the temperature. And the, the variation is not large. It's a kilocalorie or two. And I had sort of dismissed the students and said, yeah, you know, that, that's in your error bars. And if we were doing DFT, one kilocalorie is, is, is chemical accuracy. But what, what's shown over here is the difference in activation energies compared to the, 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 the uh, pure proton system. Uh, the uh, data are actually measured by temperature variation experiments. So as we exchange in sodium, the activation energy goes up a little bit. This is what we calculate for an isothermal experiment <clears throat> that the activation energy difference would have to be to produce this drop. And you see we get pretty good agreement. You know, here we're, we're talking, what, 10 kilojoules per mole, so a couple of kilocalories, not very much. Um, but it's actually well correlated with the activation energy that we get from our nitrogen production from ammonia, where, you know, this is essentially giving us the strongest acid sites, uh, highest temperature desorption peaks. And so we could essentially create a, a linear free energy relation there if we wanted to. So it's, 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 it's a nice reminder that things are a little more subtle, that we can't just, you know, swap out protons for inerts and not change the neighborhood in which those live. That the polyoxymetalates are big and well isolated from each other, but the counter cations swimming around them aren't necessarily. So it's a more complex model than we appreciate it. And just to complicate things further, here's what happens if we put these on basic supports, carbon <coughs> and carbons containing different levels of nitrogen and even carbon nitride. This is, again, plotting the oxidation turnover frequency versus the dimethyl ether turnover frequency. And again, as we remove acid sites, this comes downward. But now we don't have the linear correlation we had with sodium exchange. And what we have is a region in here where, you know, if we kill off all the acidity, it's inactive. But if we have a little bit, we actually have quite a selective oxidation catalyst. So just to conclude, you know, I think working sort of backwards here, that these polyoxymetalates uh, have fascinated me and a number of other people as model oxidation catalysts, but they're more complicated as molecular catalysts than one might expect. Um, there are different ways one can vary the proton to polyoxymetalate ratio, but these, as I've shown you, have subtle effects on the activity, even to the tune of a kilocalorie or two that makes a difference. And, you know, some of our data uh, show that some of the ways we can neutralize protons, including with basic supports, uh, let us get selective oxidation catalysts, but it's really all about controlling the acidity of, of the, the uh, catalyst, not eliminating it. Um, but the broader lesson that I draw from the two oxidation catalysis examples that I've shown you is that if we're going to reduce the, the footprint of these um, oxidation processes, we really need <coughs> molecular understanding of the 
sites and mechanisms, right? You can't, in the ethylene oxidation case, if you don't know what's controlling the selectivity, it's pretty hard to go about improving it in a rational way. Um, but, you know, one of the other challenges that I think will keep all of us employed, both those of us in the later stages of our careers and those of you in the audience in the earlier stages of yours, is, you know, we, we want to work with model systems. This is how we're going to learn the stuff here. But it is a real challenge whether we're doing experiments or calculations to pick good model systems. And you see in this latter example uh, a case in which uh, even what looks like an ideal system has got some very interesting subtleties that's going to keep us busy for, for quite a while. So with that, uh, let me thank you for your attention and uh, I would be delighted to answer any questions. My son lives in Brooklyn. I'll crash if I have to. <laughs> Although it is Brooklyn. <laughs> So the trend that you presented in the tunneling behavior um, with the peak voltages I thought was very interesting. And it seems like it's mostly an empirical relationship. Right. So I'm wondering if there is any chance of predicting something like that with the trend in the peak voltages from first principles, if there are correlations to the properties of those, of those catalysts yeah. themselves. Um, so one can do various experimental correlations. You know, I showed you the temperature ones when you can do electrochemical ones. We've also looked at uh, absorption edges in UV vis. And so it looks like, you know, basically, I think you're tunneling through the, the LUMO of these molecules. And the DFT calculations out there show that, you know, the HOMO of all of them is about the same, and it's the LUMO that's different. The, the challenge is, so the, the, we first reported this phenomenon in 1991 there still is not an adequate theoretical explanation. Uh, it's been largely ignored in, in uh, the literature. There, there's a group in Russia that's probably done some of the most sophisticated modeling yet. Uh, and, and so that's the challenge. And so if you want to do, for example, DFT, right, we got a lot of atoms there, no problem. It's a very symmetric system, except as soon as you put it on a surface, you've broken the symmetry. Right, and, and, you know, and the, the tip as well. Now, one of the experiments we've done is to put the, the, the oxides on the tip rather than on the surface, and we show we get the same, same peak at, at the same voltage. So it, it is characteristic of tunneling through the molecule and, and not, you know, sort of which side of the tunnel junction. But, you know, I, I, uh, it, it really needs uh, deeper uh, modeling and theoretical analysis than my group has ever been able to give it or anyone else has. So. Uh, Mark, I have a question on your first part. Right? So from, yeah. from your perspective, uh, what would be the relative efforts that should be put in for carbon capture versus CO2 conversion? <coughs> I know versus what? CO2 conversion. Right? <coughs> So funny you should ask. I'm, I'm currently doing double duty for the National Academies. I'm, on, I'm the only common member of two studies. Uh, one is developing a research agenda for carbon dioxide removal and reliable sequestration. And the other is developing a research agenda for uh, waste carbon utilization. Um, we need to be doing both. Um, I think the waste carbon utilization, uh, the, the challenge is that if you look at the chemical industry, it consumes, you know, what, 10% of or less of our, you know, the fossil fuels that we use for, for, um, uh, for energy. So, so in some of the best case scenarios, you're talking about putting about a 10% dent in our overall emissions. So, you know, 10% worthwhile, I, I certainly believe in the wedges approach, and I think that's, you know, 10% bites of the apple, if we have enough of those, uh, will matter. But I think the, uh, the capture and, and sequestration uh, or 
reliable storage in, in some form ultimately is going to have to happen at a scale that's, uh, you know, several times that of the, the uh, carbon conversion to, uh, to uh, permanent or durable goods. Any uh, other questions? Uh, thanks for a nice talk. I uh, wanted to ask about coming from another direction for some of this chemistry instead of selective oxidation, starting with CO2 and then reducing to some of these products. Are right. there many opportunities there and can you learn from some of these methods that you've been describing today? Um, well, one of the things, we, we have a, a small project looking at uh, one pot uh, capture and conversion of CO2 to methanol. So in some ways we are going in the other direction. Um, I think I and many others have thought more about how you might make them from, from biomass, right? If you think about um, the chemical industry and, and how we make virtually all polymers, right, it involves selective oxidation if it's not, you know, polyolefin uh, to, make, to make the monomers. So we're starting with hydrocarbons that are oxygen poor and trying to introduce oxygen. If you start from the biomass side, you're oxygen rich, you know, so the, you know, the dumb way to go about it is take all the oxygen back out and then put back the, uh, the, the amount you want, you know, by known routes, and the other is to try to do the selective deoxygenation. Uh, and, you know, and there are people trying to do that, you know, taking, uh, you know, glycerol and, and making uh, diols and, and, and things like that. Uh, the, the, the difference there is, you know, with, with selective oxidation, you've really got a tiger by the tail, right? The unselective reaction is usually more exothermic by, you know, like fourfold or something like that compared to the selective reaction. So you're really, you know, having to be clever to, to, to fight thermodynamics. And I think uh, starting from, from the other end and trying to, to do selective reduction, you're, you know, you, you don't have quite that big a cliff to fall off of. Uh, so, but, but yeah, I think, you know, the, the, you know, I'm showing you the oxymetallic cycle intermediate, right? One can imagine the relevance of that to a variety of different chemical processes. And so now that we know that such things exist, and there literally was no evidence before our work, um, you know, then you can think about, okay, what other kinds of, of chemical process might, processes might these be involved in or could, could they be utilized for? <clears throat> All right, then uh, let's thank Professor Bartol one more time. Yeah. Thank you.